This is Dr. David Proden, and I want to thank you as we begin another journey into school and community safety. If you're looking for industrial safety expert, Appalachian State University professor, Dr. Timothy Ludwig, please visit www.safety-doc.com. Again, that's Dr. Timothy Ludwig at www.safety-doc.com. Welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio host, and nationally recognized safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Join us each week as we discuss the best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. Follow Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe. Welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast. I am your host, Dr. David Proden. It is a chilly one down here this evening. As I record, the North Star weather dial is reporting 61 degrees. And uh, it's chilly, folks. This is the cold part of winter in Wisconsin. And the thing is, the humidity just continues to drop, and it feels colder back of your hands crack and all of that stuff. Great, right? So yes, one of the many reasons why the safety doc would someday like to live in a little bit warmer climate year round, but we'll see if that develops or not. Today's show will be about the law of subtraction, the bane of school safety induction. So I just did some work recently for a safety client, and the emphasis was on intra-year or mid-year induction of new staff and new students. About 10 million new teachers and new students enter a school after the first day of class, so they haven't participated in all of the professional development around school safety. They kind of get the crash course. So I talked about that with a safety client And we developed a way to address that at a school level. So I'm going to talk somewhat about that today, but then also talk about kind of an awakening I had that is going to impact all professional development for school safety. What I am going to do when I work with clients in the future, um, recommendations that I'm going to give that I haven't given before. So hang on and and we're going to get to those. Um, A couple anecdotes. The first one is, I love going through eBay and looking for used fire trucks. All you have to do is just type in used fire truck, go in the automotive section, and there are a ton. Um, It's funny because a new truck will run $600,000, $800,000. Once it's gone through its lifespan, even if it has low mileage, like 5,000 miles, um, you know, it gets to be 30 years old. That thing is selling for like three to five thousand dollars because you can't maintain it. Um, it's, it's it's outdated and they just need to get rid of it. So what happens is each of these these descriptions seems to read the same. Like bought this as a hobby project, was going to restore it and use it in parades. Haven't gotten around to it, taking up space, don't have the time. It would be a great opportunity for someone who likes to work on refurbishing things and on novel projects, make an offer. And the thing that is, maybe I've got my settings wrong on eBay, but once you, once you read the description, like I don't bid on this stuff because I don't, as much as it would be awesome to have a fire engine, I I don't have a place for it. (laughs) And, you know, so no, I can't do that. Um, But you'll get these notices ending in 10 minutes. You know, do you want to make a bid? Nope, can't. <laughs> do I want to? Well, the 10-year-old part of me, you know, the 10-year-old in me, yes, would, would love to, you know, make a bid on it. But uh, nope, I can't do it. So that's the thing, though. You know, once you look at it, then you keep getting these little updates. Or it's been relisted and it's lower. You know, you can drop $3,000. $1,000, just pick it up. I just need to get rid of it. <laughs> Anybody, please. 
So just funny though. Um, but I, I actually like one thing you'll find when there's a listing of fire engines, um, the people take a lot of photos. They really get down into the detail. So it'll always be stuff that like, we don't know if the pump works because like, or if it's certified and all of that, cause that's stuff you'd actually have to figure out how to, to use. And if you weren't a firefighter and all of that is kind of be beyond you. But, um, but as far as like taking photos, and I do like these photos of um, especially some of the older engines. Um, it's just kind of neat to go through and read a little bit on the history. So, but that's it. So yeah, I'm I'm not a lead. I'm not going to be buying um, these and putting them out in my yard. But yeah, pretty massive depreciation on on a fire engine. It only serves so long, and. Part of the deal, I, I worked with a um, with a lady whose husband serviced fire engines. Like that's that was his full business, um, and not we're not talking about like oil changes and stuff like this. But if there was something kind of you know structurally wrong with the engine, he he would go to the communities and and work on them there. I think he also had a shop. Um, but I remember he told me that once you get to 20 to 30 years on most fire engines, especially ones that are pretty actively used in the city that might be going out you know, at least a few times a day, the frames start to twist because imagine the, the weight of these engines, you know, which can be 30 feet long um, and sometimes you know, load it with 2,000 gallons of water. So we're talking about eight, eight pounds a, a gallon, I mean, you do the math, but um, he said the frames get all wonky, and, and over time, it just gets to the point where you can only calibrate things on the fire engine so long, and then you can't. You, it's, it's, it's impossible to, to do that. It's not feasible. So sometimes you just have to say it's better to just like cut your losses and sell it at this point and move on. But again, we're talking, you know, we had the open house at our local fire department, and in the window, they have when the truck was purchased and also the anticipated year of replacement and anticipated cost of replacement. And the ladder truck, the 100-foot ladder truck, the the predicted um, cost of replacement is $1.2 million. So, wow. But again, if you take that out over a lifespan of 25 to 30 years, anyway, don't contact me if you're trying to sell a fire truck. Or if you have some really cool pictures, like I guess you can contact. I'll look at the pictures not buying the truck. So had an email from my bank and big flashy, splashy attention getting email. Hey, we've, we've redesigned the bank website and we're going to tomorrow when you log in, it's going to be all different. And I'm like, wow. I mean, this was like so over the top for what it needed to be. I mean, it was like the celebration, like they had just opened a new branch you know, that they discovered that there's there's um, oil underneath the main building, you know, wh- whatever it is. I mean, it was just absolutely so over the top. And I'm like, I don't, I don't, it doesn't, I don't care. You know, I'm not trying to be insensitive, but the website seemed fine. I didn't know it was as horrible as apparently what required all of these massive updates to it. Um, I really need the website to accomplish a few things. One, I need to be able to log in and see how much money I have in the accounts. Two, I need to be able to move money between accounts. Three, that's it. Okay, that's it. I, and it worked pretty well for that. It wasn't, I had no problem navigating that at all. So I hope that they haven't added a whole bunch of crazy features or like, you know, predictions on, you know, your retirement projections or, you know, whatever they have. I don't need any of that. The site was fine. It was easy to navigate. So I haven't gone back in, but it's like, this is an example of don't fix something that's not broken. And maybe there's this whole thing behind the scenes too, of like, maybe you have to have sites like that are now with this HTTP, whatever compliant. And and if that's the case, then fine, you know, for safety. But that wasn't really in the introduction email that went out celebrating this new design on the site. Um, and the other thing is my bank charges me for checks, replacement checks, which I, I'm not a big fan of that. I think most other banks around here have kind of given up on that and will give you so many free checks a year, which we had when we started. When we moved here, the bank had free checks and a lot of things. I remember taking out certificates of deposit back in the day and they give you like a pick from a 
a toaster to like a set of screwdrivers to whatever. I picked up a set of screwdrivers I still have today because I took out a CD at a bank. Um, and that was one of the bonuses for doing that. Um, but anyway, yeah, so my bank really has, has, has raised the bar. They're starting at an 11. They're going to take it to a 15 with this new website. Oh, man. So um, we had some bizarre weather here. Put the Christmas lights out, and we had rain after that. So when you have rain instead of snow. So when you put Christmas lights together, you're stringing 100 or 300 lights. You don't want to get more than 300 because then it, it starts to get to be unmanageable. You know, of course, like my 150-foot r- rope light um, around my maple tree. You, you don't want to get too long. At the same time, if you're too short, then you keep plugging like strand into strand into strand into strand into strand, and that doesn't make a lot of sense either. So when our whole production was done in the front, I would guess the connections, probably you had 25 connections, um, which works fine when it snows or when you have a layer of snow on top. It doesn't work well when it rains. Um, It shorts it out. So it did, shorted it out, kicked out the GFI, threw over the breaker, which is all stuff that's supposed to happen versus burning your house down. Um, So I had to wait until things dried out and then, you know, checked all of the fittings to make sure that they were, they were tight, dried off anything, reset, everything was fine. But now we've had snow, a little bit of snow, not a lot, maybe two inches. Um, and it's cold. Like it is, it is cold. I mean, it might be 20 degrees, but with the wind chill, maybe 15. But the, the thing is, and I've been out in colder weather. So, I mean, some of you are like, yeah, if this cold, but like, you know, minus 20 is really, really cold. Yeah, I get it. Okay. But it's like the humidity is really low right now. When humidity is low, it feels colder. More humidity in the air, more molecules makes it seem like it's warmer. But just cold, like this bitter, ah, I don't know, just this crisp chill. So, ugh, it's not, it's not for me, not right now. But um. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc Podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin, author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. The Law of Subtraction. I've experienced this firsthand in my book, Lessons of Lore Manhattan, which um, will be out in spring. It's going through all of the, the measures it needs to go through right now with the publishing house. The initial submission of the book. So the book is about the rescue of 500,000 people in nine hours on September 11, 2001 from Lower Manhattan by boat. And it's the psychology of how this happened and then taking the lessons we learned from this examination of the psychological processes and what that might mean for rescues that happen tomorrow or five years from now or 15 years from now, 50 years from now when we reach singularity and automation. And and just what did we learn from that from a psychological perspective, not from a mechanical systems organization type perspective. Um, And, you know, which... Actually, I think that kind of got debunked a little bit. Um, But what happened from a psychology perspective? So anyway, going back on the book, submitted it 
it had 75,000 words, which was too many. Um, so there, there's a formula that the, the publisher takes where they divide out the number of words. And actually, that is only so reliable because they want to get a page count. And if you break into many paragraphs, then, of course, you're going to have more pages. So I needed to have the book trimmed from 75,000 to 60,000 words and actually got it down to 57,800, which is probably where it will stay in the process now of just kind of fine tuning some things and, and the publisher is working on some things. So, um, and getting my endorsements in um, for the book, but everything is, is looking good. But when you take out like almost 20,000 words, you think you're gonna lose a lot in, in a book because I mean, it becomes very, very, of course, personal when you're doing that. Any Anyone who's done movies, you know, George Lucas will lament about what was left on the cutting room floor and things like that. But you actually, once you're forced to tighten down the content, you come up with a much better product. Um, so this is called the law of subtraction. I'm going to talk about it today. It's very relevant because this is something that came to the forefront when I was working with one of my safety clients um, just a few weeks ago where they had start of year um, safety professional development and then days allocated to that. But then they had staff and students who started after the first day. And you don't have these in-service days and the time to do the same depth of training. So they were trying to figure out, well, how do we do induction for folks when we don't have a whole day blocked off for induction? So I said, well, we have to obviously cut. We have to trim and get down to like the meet the core points and get those delivered. And I'm thinking, well, why don't we just start there? Like, why don't we just do that right from the start? So whatever you give on the first day is the same thing you'd give to somebody mid-year. So law of subtraction is the act of removing anything that's excessive or unnecessary. The content that remains is much stronger for it. Unrestrained freedom to talk as long as you want or to create as many slides as you desire will only result in a presentation as long boring, meandering, and confusing. That's true. That's true. I mean, once we get, any of us, we've been in presentations, been in a church mass, you know, once once you get beyond um, 20 minutes, 45 minutes, especially an hour, it's like, oh my goodness, the brain fills. You hit the saturation level and, and you start to, to lose interest. This has been proven with even like the most engaging, captivating speakers. Um, you know, whether they be, you know, movie stars, you know, former presidents, current pre what, what, whatever it is, whatever it is. So, again, we have 10 million new staff and students in our schools after the first day, after the first day of class. So, let's talk about safety induction. Here's what I addressed with the safety client, just to give you some background. One of the many things here that the safety doc does. Um, so how do you streamline the induction process for new staff and new students? So the, the task was, okay, David, we only have so much time for new staff. We can maybe give them a morning um, or we could get a sub and they can um, go through our professional development, um, getting up to speed on uh, curriculum initiatives, you know, tours of the building, stuff like that. And then like safety has to be included within this. But at the start of the year, we might have had a half day, which was just fully safety. I mean, it might have been different presentations, running through some drills and stuff like that. We're not going to have that time available for this person. And also for students. I mean, I've never really seen much of an induction process for students. Um, so how do you how do you help them to learn how things are done around here? What to do if there's a lockdown drill, and how to report bullying if you're the recipient of bullying? How do you you identify threats and use the school's re threat reporting system? Or even if one exists, how do you how do you become aware of that? So we so we went through this and basically came down with the reasons to have a good induction process for one because sometimes this doesn't even happen. It's like you learn on the job. You pick up, you follow what others are doing, and you go with that. But, you know, legally, that doesn't cut it. Never really probably cut it. doesn't cut it anymore. But the reasons 
to have a robust intra year, mid year, December, January induction process, people joining your team at that point. Okay. One, it conveys accurate information. They know this is what we do if there's a fire drill, if the door is not locking for safety drills, here's the person I contact. Um, they can be assigned a peer mentor who can answer questions like that of, you know, saying like, you know, listen, like my, I'm, it says here I'm supposed to close my blinds for whatever if we have this drill, but like I, they don't seem to be closing. Like, so who do I contact? Okay, it's like this person in maintenance. Like, send them a message, tell them what's going on. They'll stop in your room, check things out. Great, thank you. The other part is, um, so it conveys accurate information. And you're not trying to convey like everything ever that happened in the school for like safety knowledge, just like the main points. Here are the main points. Keep your door locked. Um, here's the, uh, the reporting system. And now here's your go-to peer mentor for questions that you might have. And by the way, let's go through the school quick right here in the, in the cafeteria. Like that is the um, allergy um, awareness area. So that is not meant for peanut, sam you know, peanut butter sandwiches, stuff like that. Not over here. So stop in. I'll show you it during lunch. We'll be set. Um, so anyway, it conveys accurate information. The second part is it fulfills a legal obligation. You're legally obligated as an employer to teach people um, how to operate safely in their jobs and what to do in the event of an emergency. You know, it's the life jacket thing of in the airplane at the start. You know, if during if, if we do have to do an emergency landing, you will, you know, assume this crash position and, you know, the what margarine container dips down with oxygen and then your under your seat is also a flotation device and all of that stuff. But this is your legal obligation. And again, it's making sure people know the main points and what's in the handbook, like the student handbook and how the reporting system works for threats. And also, okay, if we go into a lockdown that you know what you're doing as a staff member or a student. So it covers that. So we talked about this. This all made sense. This wasn't anything that they were doing, but it's something that isn't done in most places. So um, accolades to this client for wanting to make this change was, was experiencing a lot of turnover. Also realized, hey, we have a lot of people here that just they're not up to speed with how we do things around here. So let's, let's actually formalize that out. So we worked on that, came up with a good plan. Plan actually involved creating um, a spreadsheet that you document it every person that joined your school after the first day of the year and the mentor you assign to them, peer mentor or student mentor, if it's a staff or a student, and then the professional development that you wanted them to watch. Okay, so what they did is they recorded their start of year in services. That's super easy to do, obviously, right? Like you can buy a tripod um, with that, that'll fit any smartphone. I bought one myself. And they're, they're not very expensive, maybe like 20 bucks, 30 bucks. Um, and you can adjust them and basically set your smartphone up and record any presentation. And of course, you, you can have more high-tech ways to do this, but you can record any presentation. Um, and, you know, good audio, good video. Um, then take that and edit that down. Get away from the introductions where it's like, okay, everybody, I hope you had a great summer and here's some things we want to introduce at the start of the year. You'll notice that the hallways, yes, they've been waxed. So we want to keep them looking great. So if we can, you know, if you're hauling anything, let the custodians haul it. Don't drag it across the floor. And what, I mean, all of these types of things that like no one needs to know after they've started in November. And then also the end when you're asking questions. Not that that's not important, but it's usually very much tied to that point in time and things might have changed since then or things might have been addressed like a question like well the pa system isn't heard in all of the hallways well maybe you know that's probably been addressed so there's no need for this person starting in november to like listen through all of these questions from people they don't even know um so get rid of all of that but then you're still left with a probably like a 50 minute presentation right that's too long that's simply too long so we were talking about, well, you know, it's pretty typical that most presentations are blocked off into like 50 minutes to an hour. 
for professional development. And, um, you know, that's just, that's just not the, the, that's not the way to do it. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the TED Talk approach and then some also research, but we just said, this is too long. Like the start of year, people aren't getting better professional development. They're just getting longer professional, professional development. And there's a, a big difference between that. So it, it would be a wise move to look at shortening up the type of professional development you are delivering at the start of the school year to make sure that you're hitting this kind of 18 minute range of professional development. And maybe then you go with something that is completely different. So it's not like we go 18 minutes on this part of safety, then 18 minutes on the next part of safety and 18 minutes. That's all safety. Like that's all going to blend together. It's the forgetting curve. It's all this convoluted stuff. It's like if you, you could do this part on safety, but then this part might be on, you know, something with a, some new software vocabulary system that we have available, you know, school-wide or whatever. And, you know, here's something that's, you know, with the, the new checkout process using the student ID cards for like materials in the library or something. So you, different things, 18 minutes long, different topics. So um, the other part I've seen people do, and, and this was something I had to make clear to the client is the question was, well, how do we know the competency that people are, are understanding this? I'm like, well, how do you do it at the start of the year? Uh, they said, well, people attend and they sign in and stuff. I'm like, okay, well, that means people were there. It doesn't mean that people understood it. Um, and so, like, do you do a quiz? Like, do, you, do people have to fill out some something? and Or they go online after the presentations and, and they answer questions? Or how does that work? And they're like, well, we don't do that. I'm like, well, then don't create it for mid-year people. I mean, if you're giving them even less than what you gave the new people or, or the people at the start of the year, why in the world would you create some kind of quiz to prove like that the people who start in November, December, January know this when you didn't do that at the start of the year for your whole staff? So it just almost seems like you have to do the quiz. Like it just seems like it's part of it or, you know, that the, the, the student has to demonstrate that they know how to use the, the reporting system and stuff like that, which isn't bad. But I'm just saying like, if you don't do that at the start of the year, don't, don't require that for mid-year. And so that's really where we were at. It, what, what happened, though, is that we were able to get that induction process, the videos, which were very good, um, school safety videos on bullying and then um, lockdowns and fire drills and the threat reporting system. Basically, they broke that into three separate videos, which were 18 minutes each, and we kind of put together an agenda for professional development of what they would, would provide to people um, during, you know, this, this induction process. So they would have, you know, four or five people all kind of there. They would put it together. So these are all people who might have, you know, been employed in the last two, three, four weeks start it. Because part of it is like you start someplace, you got to know where, at, where the rooms are, get your bearings how things work. Hey, here's how I go through the lunch line and, you know, here's whatever. Um, here's where I'm supposed to park. Um, all the nuances of, of what goes on, like where are the bathrooms in the building? I mean, all of these things, like, and just knowing people's names. So you get that. And then, um, you know, immediately you get a peer who is looking out for somebody, but you, you give them a little time to have a context of the building and the students. And then, you make this professional development available for them. So we talked about the things, what do you really need people to know? And we were able to prioritize that and really get that down to like, we, we really need people to know like these six things. And of those three of them um, were safety related. We were like, you know, they, they can get caught up on the rest of it just through induction process, through mid-year in services, through, um, or, I mean, not induction, almost like osmosis, you know, just like they're, they're going to pick up on some of these things just through their um, professional learning communities, like, you know, how we, how we do item analysis on tests and things like that. Um, so how, how the grading structure works, all of those things, which, you know, are more mechanical, you can get those figured out, not life and death. But we did, we did identify that we want to know, we want people to know the, the drills, how, how the drills function, um, their role in that, uh, 
bullying, harassment, and non-discrimination, how that relates to the handbook, and then also the school safety reporting, uh, threat reporting system, how to access it, what it is, how investigations happen. So those three things, each of those were, were their own unique presentations of about an hour. We got those down to 18 minutes each. They edited those down to 18 minutes. Um, and what they did then is they put together, again, a room of four to five staff uh, who've been hired in the last, you know, two to four weeks, had them um, sit down, you know, with a, with a teacher or, you know, it was principal, whoever, someone, and, and they watched these and they would watch them. People were engaged for that 18 minutes and then they would, would talk about it. W- what questions do you have right now? Otherwise, ask your peer uh, mentor and the peer mentor knew the videos. That was one thing too. The peer mentors all like had access to these. So um, someone could say, I saw, I saw this like about um, the reporting system. Now, is that like just online or is like, is there a phone component to that? Or like, does it work with both Mac and PC or is there like an app? Or I mean, things like that. That'll go like to, to the peer mentor and the mentor will say like, okay, yeah, here's how this works. Good question. Very good question. Thanks for asking. So, um, yeah, that it's amazing to you when you sit down with people and you start to prioritize what's really important. There's a lot of things that are really important to people that really aren't that important to people. <laughs> it's like in my book of 75,000 words, um, very good content and even 18,000 words thinner in that manuscript. It is still very salient, powerful, meaningful content. It's just, it's much better because this extra amount of words really wasn't necessary to convey the meaning. The, the meaning Again, book very well written, but we didn't need this. So it's this, this whole thing. You film a lot, you go a little bit extra in the movie, and then you chop it down into what you want the story to be. So, um, FEMA does does this. You can go online and get free online FEMA trainings. If you just type in free plus online FEMA trainings, they come up. Um, those online courses actually do a really good job of keeping down into short snippets that you go through. And the courses themselves, they'll take a course, which if you were to present it in person, would take you four to five hours at least. Um, and, and they get that down to like where you can get through it in one to two hours. So they've, they've got the good model kind of going for professional de- development there. But um, again, you, that's more, you're, you're taking that, you don't have a peer, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know. You don't have a peer, you, you can't ask questions. So let's, let's talk even about some additional research on this. So George Washington University conducted research and, and found that after, after 10 minutes, okay, when you're showing a PowerPoint after 10 minutes, most of the audience ch- checks out, goodbye. They're either on their smartphones, thinking about something else, whatever. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. So think about how you assemble a PowerPoint, you know, and here's slide 72 and then 75. When I did my presentation for my basically my doctoral thesis, what I want it to do. Um, I think I was limited to maybe seven or nine slides, something like that, that you had to convey your research plan in the seven to nine slides. And it wasn't so much that there was a time limit because they could ask you a lot of questions. So when I say they, it's like the the people on, on your committee, which were maybe like, I don't know, six, seven people, something like that. But, but, the reason they do that is they force you to be super concise and it's great. Actually, it was terrific. I remember I started out at maybe at 15 slides and then worked it down to 12 and to 10 and, you know, nine and, you know, maybe got it to the eight or seven, whatever it was. But I was so on top of my presentation when I came in because it's like, boom, here's the point, boom, here's the point, boom, here's the point. And then, you know, when people have questions, you didn't have all this um, additional information for them to, to wade through and whatever. You just it was it was sharp, 
And I'm like, that's why they did it because they sit through these things all the time. And they want people to get really concise and to the point and make a very precise delivery. So I think there was a lot of takeaway in that that I didn't realize at the time I gave it. Like I thought it was, I thought it wasn't enough. I thought it would be better. Of course, more is better, right? Um, kind of the school model of when you do professional development and public K twelves of you know how many presentations can you jam into a day and everything has to be an hour because an hour is just the way that it is. Um, but no, it was at seven to eight slides. And I wish afterwards, actually, they would have said, you know, the reason we had you do this was to force you to identify what your priorities were and to be very, very concise with your hypothesis and everything. Um, yeah, they never said that. So, but George Washington University, 10 minutes is is the maximum for your PowerPoint presentation. They actually said, okay, the researcher, um, John Medina said, uh, he's a biologist, okay. Given a presentation of moderately interesting content, your audience's attention will, quote, plummet to near zero, quote, after nine minutes and 59 seconds. Before the first quarter hour is over, in, typical present, in a typical presentation, people usually have checked out, says Medina, who cites peer-reviewed studies to reinforce this presentation. Ouch. Ouch. So, um, so he's saying 10 minutes. You've got 10 minutes. And once you get to like 25, forget it. Like everybody's gone. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I would say that's accurate to most of the presentations I've probably ever attended. And I used to get roped into um, administrative team meetings on Monday mornings as a school administrator. Most of those would be about three hours long and realistically um, could have been less than an hour, easily less than an hour. Have you come in, you concisely present, you know, maybe you have, again, your seven, eight minutes to present on whatever, or that we just limited topics to seven or eight minutes, got the information out there, made a decision, moved on. We'd have been so much more effective. So much time wasted in in, in those meetings, in those mornings. Um, yeah, just, just incredible, incredible time sink. So time sink, when you have a heat sink, like in a computer, a heat sink, sucks the heat away from the machine so it keeps running. These are time sinks. They just suck away the time that you'd be doing other things. They're horrible. So, you know, there, there's a model out there that seems to work, though. And most of us have probably watched TED Talks. And the average, not the average length, like the length of a TED Talk, you get a countdown, 18 minutes, 1, 8, 18 minutes on a TED Talk. And it doesn't matter who you are, you have 18 minutes on a TED, TED Talk. So um, the research behind that and research and research and research is um, was articulated by the um, TED Talk curator, Chris Anderson. So he explained the organization's thinking about the 18-minute threshold. So I'm going to read this. 18 minutes is long enough to be serious and short enough to hold people's attention. It turns out that this length also works incredibly well online. It's the length of a coffee break. So you watch a great talk and forward the link to two or three people. It can go viral very easily. The 18 minute length also works much like the way Twitter forces people to be disciplined in what they write. By forcing speakers who are used to going on for 45 minutes to bring it down to 18, you get them to really think about what they want to say. What is the key point they want to communicate? It was a clarifying effect. It brings discipline. I agree. I completely agree. When I was doing professional presentations for some of my safety clients, um, I was going too long initially in the presentations. And when I say too long, I mean, you know, 25 minutes, 45 minutes in that range, which I thought was short. I felt I wasn't giving them enough information 
And um, in fact, by being brief, I was doing them a better service. So, so that's that's the 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 paradox of all of this, right? Is that if you come in and you deliver a presentation that's 18 minutes long, people are going to be like, "We're paying this guy a lot of money," and he just delivered an 18 minute presentation. And now what? But the reality is, through understanding the learning process, the engagement process. It's much better for me to give a very clarified, disciplined 18-minute presentation than to give a 50-minute presentation. You're just going to learn more. You're going to retain more. You're going to be engaged more. We, there's always time for questions. You can mingle with people. You can ask questions of, of them. They can ask questions of you. They can show you things, all things that are ancillary. But to send that core message out, whether it be here's school threat reporting, here's here's how leakage fits into that, here's what threat reporting looks like, here's what the system looks like, here's what the response looks like. You get all of that down in 18 minutes and some data to go with that. We are great. We don't need to go beyond that because we know that's not going to be effective. So TED Talk, 18 minutes, like I said, the, the previous study was saying, what, 10 minutes for the PowerPoint. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc Podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin, author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. So that's also a part I've learned as a consultant in the field of school safety is it is okay for me to give a very concise presentation. The one that I just delivered for professional development was seven minutes and 53 seconds. Delivered in video, delivered in MP3, and then also has a one page companion document that goes with it, um, directly corresponds and and builds off of what the presentation is about. But imagine that. So I'm getting paid to develop seven minutes, 53 seconds in easy to access format. If you are a school administrator or teacher, you can watch me for that amount of time. Background's different. It's not what you see right here. But um, you can watch me for that amount of time. Very concise. I'll put a few points up on the screen. Um, but yeah, seven minutes, 53 seconds. Or if, if you can just if listen in, um, you know, maybe on a drive or something like that, tune in. Easy, easy listening. Seven minutes, 53 seconds in that one page. How many times do we get these PowerPoints? And they're like, oh, we're going to save space. So we're just going to we're going to put six slides on, or no, we'll do the three slides, and we'll do the right where you can write comments and lines as we go through these. And first of all, I always number those things because I, you know where you're at. But make I like I number very large because I need I want people to find things very quickly. But it's like no, I would do professional development where I would bring a milk crate because I'd have so many copies. Okay, here's the copy of the first thing that I'm going through, and it is, you know, 14 pages long. Here's a copy of this and this and this and this. So I had great information. Um, This was maybe a little bit before the age when you could just send things out in electronic. But at the same time, I'm not going to send somebody, you know, seven articles uh, in PDF format and other things that I put together because they're not going to go through it ahead of time. They don't have the time. I don't blame them for that. Um, 
we don't live in a world where we have time for that. That's like a college class, okay? So what I'm doing is I'm you get nothing ahead of time. Like when I'm when I'm consulting specifically in these instances, I'll listen. We'll have a conversation of what the needs are. Um, got it? I'll come in, and then it's, again, it's one sheet. Call it companion document. Okay, one sheet, one sheet, one side, one sheet. Very easy to follow. Kind of laid out. Ends with this call to action. Like here's exactly what you need to do. Um, then the seven minute, 53 second video. And then I just rip that over into audio. And I render both of those in, in a high quality too, because no one wants to listen to junky audio with noise and stuff like that. But yeah, but it, the, so like I'm listening to this and I'm thinking as a consumer though, does it, do you, do you feel like you're getting your value for that? I mean, am I getting my value? And you are, because I spent the time behind the scenes ripping this initial presentation I put together that came out to 20 minutes, down to 15 minutes, down to 12, down to whatever, down to eight. I've done all of that in that consolidating to get down the prioritized points to you in a very disciplined manner. It's not a first take. There are so many takes that come into the product that gets delivered to the client. But this is what we need to do for the induction process for school safety. We cannot just dump our start of school year, one hour presentation for this, one hour presentation on for this onto people because it's not gonna soak in. It's like rain resistant, just the water goes right off of them, repels. The peer can help them, but you get things down into these concise 18 minute or less segments. And you only figure out what we really need. Bullying and harassment, yes, very important. We know that can lead to um, harm to self, harm to others, depression. Understanding our drills, of course, very, very important. Um, active shooter drills, fire drills. Um, how to identify and report threats, critical, crucial elements to your school safety. So some thoughts. I, I think we should use a countdown clock like they have in sports when we are giving presentations. I think we should have a big clock, like easy to see. Like if you're playing football, you know, and they have it up in the end zone. So nothing you've got to mess around with. I know they have these on podiums and I think like I have a laser pointer that has one, but I mean, you can't, it's, it's not easy. Like you got to try to small, it's, it's not easy to see. Like I'm talking something big that's overt and it changes color. So, you know, it, it either does a count up or count down or whatever it is to zero to 18 or 18 to zero. It doesn't have a horn at the end, but I mean, and maybe, you know, it starts out as green and when it gets to 10 minutes, it goes to amber. When it gets to, you know, four minutes, it goes to red. So you know where you're at. I actually used something kind of like that in a presentation I did in PBS, for PBS a few years ago. Um, someone in the audience was using color-coded cards. So I always kind of knew where I was at because that was very fluid in the moment um, for that presentation. And, and that worked out well. So um, that might seem very counterintuitive to order like a big shot clock, <laughs> basically for your presenter, but I think it's a good thing. I would do it. I would completely do it. Um, for my podcast, I have uh, the time. I know how long I've been recording. It's up on the up on the screen. Um, I actually do have a manual timer. I'll use for for some other recordings also. But um, I need this show to be one hour long f to fulfill my time spot with the 405media.com has to be an hour long. So that's why the show eventually gets edited to an hour after, you know, commercials and all of that stuff is it's an hour. So that's why I go an hour. Um, now with that, knowing what I know, am I keeping people's attention? If they're really into the topic, they'll probably stick around for more of it, but probably not much longer than 18 minutes. They'll use this as a, as a resource to pull pieces of information out. Um, but again, it's the 405media.com out of Los Angeles, California airs the show. So too, if you're listening in your car on the 405, um, in Los Angeles, you're in for, you know, your two hour commute. So the audience that is going to pull this podcast, um, 
sometimes they prefer longer podcasts. Like there will be times I will go in and just search for podcasts that are 90 minutes or longer on topics that I that I am interested in because I know I have a long commute and I don't want to be flipping through different podcasts and listening. You know, I, I have the time to go deeper into some of these things. Um, so in those cases, yeah, I specifically will search that out. And I'll have guests on, and we'll go longer sometimes. I put that available for people. But again, that's why my shows are an hour. If I was to do a different podcast, I don't know what the topic would be on. But um, you know, I guess I would probably aim for that 18 minutes or less. It also makes it easier for editing and releasing, and people have to download all of these things and stream them too. It's easier to do it if it's not as long. But this countdown clock, I, I think it has some merit, like a big two-foot like numbers counting down. So, um, I I always thought when I was when I was attending church years ago as a kid, um. My favorite priest was always the priest that was the shortest and told the the coolest stories. So the sermons, um, you know. But if you could get in and, and in and out, mass was done in forty minutes. Like thumbs up, nice job. The person that won like seventy minutes didn't matter about the sermon. Like dude, got other things going on here. Okay, so that's too long. So we needed the church shot clock. Where I don't know how they work it in. You know, maybe it starts at 45 minutes. Uh, once the priest reaches the altar, clock starts. He gets two timeouts. After that, it's just a countdown to zero. That time it ticks out, mass is over. It doesn't matter where you're at. Hopefully you've had Eucharist. But if not, catch it on the way out. So I think if we look back to the meetings that we looked forward to, you and I, meetings that we actually look forward to, they were probably the ones that were short and concise. Um, for me, they were. Like I, the meetings, I, I worked with an administrative team early in my school career. Uh, the superintendent, uh, very concise, would come in, make, made sure everybody was there on time. That was another thing. Like just everybody needed to be there on time because we all had other things to do. And so you were there on time. The meetings were... Um, concise, you know, and, and I don't, I don't know, everybody got so much time to talk or you could pass if you didn't have anything. Um, and I don't know, maybe we had seven, eight minutes each, but I, I remember these meetings, literally, um, you'd get your coffee and sit down and I don't, I think the meeting was done before I was done with my first cup of coffee and we were moved on and I thought that they were productive and they were energetic and I look forward to them and we got things done. So, you know, you don't have to you don't have to go long on these things to have them be effective. So, it's that's such a such a fallacy and people have just gotten used to it. They've, they've just gotten used to it. And I talked about it before, the, the the peer mentor Having somebody assigned to you in any capacity that you work in, in any organization, um, in, and that that person, um, you have some time with them um, and in that first week. And usually the thing is once people start to do their job, they kind of figure it out. Like most jobs are kind of intuitive and people have been trained for whatever so they know it. Um, and you want to get people like kind of into their job pretty fast because – if you're not, if you start pondering your job and asking questions, you usually start to go toward the deficit side or like what could be bad about the job or, you know, what are all these roadblocks that are going to come in with scheduling and all of that. It's like, that's something I learned too. It's like, you want to get people, you know, once, once they get the basics of understanding the building and, you know, uh, who, who do you call if you're sick and you know, stuff like that, whatever, get all of that done, the paperwork, uh, you, schedule, you want to get people into their job, at least exposed to parts of their job. So maybe like after a day or so, and you're doing a couple hours and more and then whatever, um, people settle in faster and then they know the questions to ask. Hey, I worked with whatever and I noticed like this, this, and this. I'm like, okay, well, that's, here's my response to this, this, and this. Or like, I'm not sure, but I know the person that we can ask about this. Or yeah, right on, 
you've identified a piece of equipment that is in a box. It seems like it was ordered four years ago and arrived four years ago. You'd like to use it, but like, does, is it okay? Like, because it hasn't been used before. Well, yes, like use it. (laughs) That was actually a question I had. Um, so, you know, um, but a peer mentor and people over time will have fewer questions. They'll be able to figure things out on their own. And, but you want them to be able to come to you with questions. Um, and you've got institutional knowledge, institutional history, if you're the one that's the peer or whoever is the peer. Now for students, so you can go a whole different direction or kids with this. Um, imagine, you know, a new fourth grader moves in and some, they have a peer buddy and you can make this whole ambassador program. It can be this thing that you can celebrate. You're part of the ambassador program. So the next new student that moves in, you're going to be assigned to them for a week. So you're going to help them get through the lunch line, how to get out to where the bus is, understand the safety drills, understand the school reporting system. If there's a threat um, of how to report that, who to report that to, what, how to use the system, um, how to check something out from the library, whatever. Um, That is your job. You're their go-to person. And you need to keep questions, you know, offer them the opportunity to ask questions. Like, do you have any questions about this? Do you have questions about this? Um, And introduce them to people like out at recess, like here is the recess monitor or the recess monitors, or here's this person. And so those types of things are terrific for school safety, terrific for school safety, showing where some of the the exits exits are in the school. just, you know, here's, here's the bus has come up and, you know, you see this line out here, like painted this yellow line. Um, we all have to stay in back of that. Periodically teachers will remind us to stay in back of it, but make sure you're staying back of that. Um, because it, and never walk in front of the buses, you know, things like that, but all these little nuanced things into like, here's the playground and make sure we're doing this on a playground. And here's like some of the equipment that's only like the younger kids use. We don't go over in that area and, and whatever. Um, so you can do that at any level and at the high, high school level, it's also, it's terrific. I mean, imagine the high school block schedules, like your Tuesday is different than your Wednesday is different than your Thursday. And then two weeks later it changes. Now you have this other block and whatever, but, um, you know, thing, things like this and people, the kids will know it, the students will know it and they'll want to share that. And it puts them in a leadership role and refreshes them. There was something, towns do this. My, my hometown did this a couple months ago. Um, Fire departments deliver pizzas through the, you know, the local pizzerias or whatever um, for a night. You can have, if you call in and have a pizza ordered, the fire department will deliver it. And you can make a donation, I think, to the fire department. But the reason this is done, though, is so the fire department becomes familiar with the community, the different streets in the community, and they also have to identify the hydrants that they pass. So it's this really cool way of um, involving in the community, you know, through this whole thing of just delivering pizzas, but it's it's this whole process, too, of making firefighters. Because, again, induction, your firefighters turn over. People are being trained in, in coming on the force, going off the force, and understanding, here's where this part is. Where is Franklin Street? I don't know. 303 Franklin Street. Okay, well, there it is. Okay. Where are the two closest hydrants? Here and here. Here's your pizza. All right. Oh, yeah. What? I thought you wanted anchovies. No. So thank you for listening to the show. Thank you to the 405 Media and John Grant out of Los Angeles for supporting this show. Thank you to Sprigio for supporting this show. Sprigio, S-P-R-I-G-E-O dot com, the nation's leader in school safety reporting. Also an appreciation to Aaron Clary and the Clary podcast. You can check that out at captaincapitalism.blogspot.com. Also check out TJ Martinell and the Mountain Pass podcast. Those are the podcasts. If you kind of want to turn your mind back to the 1940s and 50s from a guy who's in his early 30s living in a cabin who loves to hike the outdoors with his dog. This has been the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio show host, and leading safety expert, Dr. David Perotin. 
Remember to check back each week for the latest, best, and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. You can find Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe.